Hello, this is Susan Woods, your self-appointed Black Lives Matter fraud investigator. Thank you so much for your time. I've been away for a while, but I am back now. I am still on the case. So as you may recall, I had started investigating or analyzing the Form 990 information return that the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation submitted for the fiscal year 2020. I had gone through the heading in parts one, two, three, and four. So that comprised five episodes. So now what I'm going to do in this video message is talk about um, the red flags. I had, I had identified red flags when I explained each part of the Form 990. Again, I already talked about the heading. Then I talked about part one, part two, part three, and part four. So those were the five episodes. So in this video message, I'm going to summarize those red flags before we move forward to analyzing another part of the Form 990 information return. So please bear with me as I pause my screen so that I can share with you the Form 990 information return again so that you can see what I'm talking about and then we will come back and finish up. So just one moment again, and I appreciate your patience with me having to go from screen to screen, but we're almost here. Now, this is the Form 990 information return that the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation submitted you remember I, ha I had been asking about the money. I kept saying, where is the money? Where is the money? Well, they finally submitted in a Form 990 for the year 2020. And as you can see across the top, all Form 990 information returns are for public inspection. So this is the public inspection copy. Now, as I went through this information originally, I really went into detail to explain the red flags. I'm not going to go into that much detail now because I've already explained it. I'm just reminding you of it now as a way of summarizing the red flags. So in this first section, this is the heading of a Form 990 information return where you see the letters A through the letter M. So this whole section up here is called the heading. And I had identified four red flags in the heading. And I highlighted them here. The first red flag was in the letter A for the 2020 calendar year or tax year beginning July the 1st, 2020 and ending June 30th, 2021. The red flag was the fiscal year does not match the fiscal year that they identified on their determination letter when they were incorporated as a 501c3 nonprofit organization. When the IRS granted status, the fiscal year ended December the 31st. So this was intentional to start July the 1st, 2020 and end June 30th, 2021, because as you may recall, George Floyd was murdered on May the 25th. And after that time, between May the 25th through June the 30th, is when they generated the majority of the money from his death. So someone st strategically thought about how to change the fiscal year to ignore May and June of 2020 and pick up with July and end June 30th, 2021, when everything had already died down. So that was the first red flag. The second red flag that I identified was in letter F, the name and address of the principal officer. Charlemagne Bowers is the principal officer. As a matter of fact, he is serving as the secretary of the nonprofit organization. The red flag for that was he was also serving as a consultant and generated over $2 million in that role. So that was a blatant conflict of interest to serve on the board as the secretary and then be paid as a consultant 
over $2 million because when you serve on the board, you are on the governing body that determines salaries. So he was on a governing body that determined his own salary, which was a conflict of interest. The thing I pointed out, red flag number three, was in G, the gross receipts. The gross receipts that they um, admitted to here or that they added here was $79,644,823. This is what they entered on this Form 990, which does not match up with what they said they earned in 2020, which is $90 million. So as you can see, this is not $90 million, and I've already explained probably why they changed the fiscal year end date so that they didn't have to include all of the revenues that they generated in 2020. But in all of the materials that they have on their website, um, they, state that, they state that they earned $90 million. They admit to that. But here, a red flag says that they are claiming $79,644,823. So that's a red flag number three. The fourth red flag is in letter M. And letter M says, a reads, State of Legal Domicile, Del Delaware. Well, when I went to the Delaware Secretary of State's office to check the status of their um, incorporation, it is not in good standing. So that's red flag number four. And then I also wondered why they would incorporate in Delaware and operate in California. When you do that, you can incorporate in whatever state you want. That's not the issue. Well, that is an issue, but that's a confusing issue. But the point I'm making is they can incorporate in Delaware, but they are also supposed to incorporate in the state in which they generate the most money, which would have been California. And I didn't find any information at the Secretary of State's office for the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation in California. And as you can clearly see, they state they operate in Oakland, California. So that's a red flag. So there were four red flags in the heading of this Form 990 information return. So let's go on now to part one. Part one is the summary. Now you may recall that part one corresponds with episode number two. And in episode number two, I stated that I was not going to really examine part one yet because according to the Form 990 instructions, you're supposed to come back and complete part one, the summary, after you've completed all of the other parts of the Form 990. This is sort of like the executive summary that you would do for a research report. You wouldn't write your executive summary before you've written a report. So the person who completed this Form 990 skipped over part one, the summary, and completed all of the other parts and then came back to enter this information. So that's how I'm going to treat that during this analysis as well. I'm not going to analyze part one. I'm going to go through the Form 990 and come back to part one and analyze it then because I see plenty of red flags already, but I'm not going to identify them yet. So let's keep going to part two. Now, part two is called the signature block. And this is where the signature of an officer was signed and date this prepared Form 990. And also the organization or the company that prepared this Form 990 will also sign and date um, and put their firm's name and the firm's address and the EIN number, phone number. And you can see all of that here. But the red flags that I am identifying in part two, the signature block, are number one, signature of the officer. And I've already pointed out that's Shalamaya Bauer, Shalamaya Bowers, the board secretary. Okay, I've already pointed out that he has a conflict of interest going on being the board secretary and being paid over $2 million as a consultant. That's a clear violation of the conflict of interest policy. And then the second red flag in this section was the date. The date is 5-13-2022. Now, I've already stated that they changed the fiscal year to be July the 1st. Let's go back up so I can make sure I'm quoting correctly. July the 1st, 2020 until June the 30th, 2021. 
Okay. That's their fiscal year that they're claiming. Now, your Form 990 information return is due five months and 15 days after your fiscal year ends. So their Form 990 information return was due, let's see, July, August, September, October, November, the 15th is when their Form 990 information return is due when you use the rule of the IRS that says five months and 15 days after the end of your fiscal year. Now, so their Form 990 is technically not due or was not technically due until November the 15th. Let's go back down. The red flag for me for the date is it looks like they're trying to meet the fiscal year end if they use the calendar year because the calendar year fiscal year ends December the 31st. So five months and 15 days at the December the 31st is May the 15th. So what is the rush? Because somebody is not using their brain and they're forgetting that they have in one place in the determination letter that their fiscal year ends December the 31st. So that means their Form 990 is due May the 15th, but they're not using their head. They forgot that they changed their fiscal year. They had until November the 15th to turn this in in 2021. But now they're waiting all the way to May the 15th or May the 13th, 2022. So it, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. And even if, never mind. So that's two red flags for part two. Two red flags for part two. Let's keep going. Part three, statement of program service accomplishments. Now, in part three, I've identified some red flags here as well. So part three, again, talks about the statement of program service accomplishments. This is what you have accomplished, past tense. So number one, briefly describe the organization's mission. Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation is working inside and outside of the system to heal the past, reimagine the present, and invest in the future of Black lives through policy change, investment in our communities, and a commitment to arts and culture. Now tell me what is the accomplishment there? The tangible accomplishment, what is it? So that's red flag number one. Red flag number two is down to 4A. The expenses for this one was $14,445,678. So grassroots, we are working and collaborating with black leaders to support on the ground organizing for over $14 million. What is the tangible accomplishment? 4B, for $14,200,203, 4B says, or reads, Healing Justice Program. We are developing a model for creating space for survivors and families impacted by police violence and trauma to heal and thrive that can be replicated across the country. We are creating national and international campaigns that build coalitions amongst community activists, leaders, and organizers, and supporting the work of organizations as they support Black-led and intersectional movement work locally and internationally by building infrastructure, membership, and presence, providing seed funding, developing programming, providing training, and providing public relations, communications, and fundraising assistance. Additionally, we are working to develop initiative, initiatives to build Black wealth, power, and self-determination. What's the tangible achievement for $14,200,203 for 4B? 4C, 
red flag number three, two million seven hundred and twenty nine hundred and sixty dollars. Arts and culture program. We are bringing to life the core values and beliefs of BLM GNF, Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, in a way that engages and centers Black artists and Black people. We support emerging and established individual Black artists who stand in solidarity with marginalized communities. In addition to uplifting the voices of the Black arts community, this program serves as a connection point to provide art exposure and education for disenfranchised communities, particularly for youth. This program convenes a Black Lives Matter Arts and Culture Global Arts Advisory Council, which will create a coalition of established and emerging leaders in the global arts community, run art activations through which we will, we will create pop-up art galleries in at least four major cities globally per year to be curated by the global arts. What's the tangible achievement? What have they done? Now, what are they planning to do? What have you done with $2,720,960? $2,720,960. What have you done? It says accomplishments. Then you have 4D, other program services described in Schedule O, $1,672,000. $1,826. So the total for this section is $33,039,667 of vague, abstract statements. It says, clearly says, statement of program service accomplishments. I should be reading what you have already done. What tell me tangibly the success? How many did you enroll? Who graduated? What did they do after graduation? That's what an accomplishment tells you. We, sh we should be able to evaluate based on quantitative data, numbers, qualitative data. What is the behavioral change? That's what qualitative data measures the behavioral change in your clients after they completed a program. The quantitative data, data tells us the percentage of people who completed, the total number who were enrolled. I don't see any of that for $33 million. So I've identified six, I think it's six, one, two, three, four, five, six red flags in that section. Last part that I talked about already in episodes one through five, this would be part four, checklist of required schedules. So this was episode number five, and it talked about part four. So I identified some red flags here too that I highlighted. So the first one is, is number three. Did the organization engage in direct or indirect political political campaign activities on behalf of or in opposition to candidates for public office. And they said no, which is not true because they hosted a banquet for Joe Biden. So that's clearly um, engaging in political campaign activities. They hosted a fundraising campaign or a fundraising banquet for Joe Biden. Let's keep going. 14A. Did the organization maintain an office, employees, or agents outside of the United States? They indicated no for 14A, which is a blatant lie. They have an office in Toronto, Canada that is run and operated by Patrice Khan Cooler's wife. And they just recently purchased a mansion for over $6 million for their office space. So that is a blatant lie. And they are operating in Canada, which is outside of the United States. The next red flag is 27. Did the organization provide a grant or other assistance to any current or former officer, director, trustee, key employee, creator or founder, substantial contributor or employee thereof, 
a grant selection committee member or to a 35% controlled entity, including an employee thereof or family member of any of these persons? They said no, but the answer is yes. Patrice Kahn Coolers hired her brother, her biological brother, as a member of her, of her security team and paid him a significant amount of money for that role. No security experience. She just gave him a job. In addition, she hired her, the son, I'm sorry, the father of her son. She hired the father of her son to serve as a graphics designer and paid him a significant amount of money to be a graphics designer with no experience whatsoever. So this is not true. They did hire family members who are related to the officers, the directors, or trustees, which Patrice Kahn Cooler, of course, Coolers, of course, was the executive director of the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation, as well as one of the founders. So that's not a true statement. When they said no, the answer should have been yes. And I think I have one more. 36, Section 501c3 organizations. Did the organization make any transfers to an exempt, non-charitable related organization? They indicated no here, but the answer is actually yes. The Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation donated over $30 million to LGBTQIA organizations. And I had created a series in which I was talking about each one of those organizations and I am going to finish that series. But the answer to that question should be absolutely yes, although they stated that it was no. So in this section, let's see how many red flags I identified. This is part four or checklist of required schedules. And I already explained what a schedule is in episode number five. So I identified one, two, three, four red flags in this section. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to pause my screen and I'm going to go back to the presentation so that we can wrap this up. Thank you for your patience. So now I'm going to show you the summary page that I created, Red Flags Summary. So in episode one, again, I focused on the heading. So in the heading, I identified four red flags, the calendar year, the gross receipts, the board secretary, and the date, I'm sorry, and the secretary of state location, which was Delaware. So that's four red flags in episode number one, which focused on the heading. Episode number two, remember it was part one summary. That's to be determined. So I didn't identify any red flags there because I'm going to come back to that. Episode number three was part two, the signature block. I talked about the board secretary again, being Shalomaya Bowers and the conflict of interest that he is um, guilty of committing. And then the filing date, I brought that up as 5-15-22. I don't know why they used that date for filing of a 2020 Form 990 information return. So I used that as two or identified two red flags in episode number three. Episode number four, which was part three, Statement of Program Services and Agreements, I identified six red flags. Number one, the mission does not match what's what they indicated as a mission on their website. 4A, 4B, 4C, 4D were very vague. Um, 4D referred to Schedule O. And then 4E, I'm just confused about the $33 million that was spent on very vague information. So there were six red flags identified in episode number four. And then finally, episode five, which was part four, the checklist of required schedules. Number three, political campaign banquet for Joe Biden. They said they didn't engage in any politics, which they clearly did. 14A maintains office outside of U.S. in Toronto, Canada, when they said they don't have an outside of, outside of the United States. 
27 provides financial assistance for unqualified people. The father's son, I'm sorry, I should have put the son's father, the son's father, and then her brother, Patrice Conkula's son's father, and then Patrice Conkula's brother are unqualified people to receive financial assistance. And number four, 36, they gave grant money to LGBTQ, I, I'm sorry, LGBTQ, there should be a Q there, TIA. Um, organizations that did not have 501c3 status. So I identified four red flags there. And I apologize for those errors. I will correct those. So how many errors do we have in just five parts of the Form 990? You have the heading. You have the Part 1 summary, which I didn't count any errors, any red flags. Part 2, signature block. Part three, statement of program service agreements. Part four, checklist of required schedules. So what is the total? The total red flags from the heading to part four, 16 red flags. 16 red flags already. Already. That is ridiculous. Red flags meaning something is wrong. The information you sh are sharing on the Form 990 is not correct. There are 63 pages in this Form 990, and we've only gotten through the first four sections. I'm sorry, the first five sections, the heading, and then parts one, two, three, and four. And we have we already have accumulated 16 red flags. That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous, but not surprising. My concern is that some people are going to look at them submitting the Form 990 as, okay, they did it. They're, they're showing us the money. You've been asking to show me the money. They've shown you the money. Now what? Don't just accept the Form 990 as being accurate and say, okay, they've, they've done that. No, analyze it. Analyze it. If I can find 16 red flags, I know a forensic accountant can provide, can find even more. If I found 16, I know a forensic accountant can find even more than that. So what's coming up next? Next, we're going to go into episode six, which is going to cover part five. And that's statements regarding other IRS filings and tax compliance. So that's episode six, part five of the Form 990 Information Return 2020. And part six, I'm sorry, part five is talking about statements regarding other IRS filings and tax compliance. Again, this is Susan Woods your self-appointed Black Lives Matter fraud investigator. Thank you so much for your time and have a great day.